Good afternoon, everyone. This is Aileen again from Long Beach Public Library. How is everybody today? We're doing a phenomenal program on the houses of worship. And the reason why I picked this is because being that Long Beach in the very beginning, because I wrote that it was from 1880, of course, to the current time, um, is because the picture in the background is of the Long Beach Hotel, which was built in 1880. Now you have to think back about Long Beach when it started, it was a, a salt marsh and there wasn't anything here except for the hotel, the railroad tracks across Barnum Island to Long Beach came all the way to Broadway where there was a little railroad station a water tower to help fill the locomotives because we had steam engines back then. And in a time where people were coming from the city because it was warm and it was hot and they came out to the beach to spend the summers. And this hotel was the accommodation for that. So Long Beach was only a summer place back then in 1880, but they also had built with the hotel a whole line of cottages now, this is supposed to be cottage number one. This photograph is circa 1904. And the cottage is a chapel. And they call it Grace Chapel. So it's very interesting that people coming out here just for the summer to spend the time at the beach, to play games, to have fun on the sand. Um, they had um, all different sorts of things that they could do for the summer but yet there is a place to go and pray. There's a place of worship on the barrier, which is the very first chapel. And it's a summertime place. Remind you, this is back to 1880 to around 1904, this picture was taken of the marsh. Grace Chapel was an Episcopal church built in approximately between 1880 and 1904. Of course, the hotel and some of the cottages burned down in the fire in 1907, but the congregation then had its services at Hotel Nassau. This became part of St. James Episcopal Church. Now, a little bit later down in the program, we're going to talk about St. James Episcopal, which opens in around 1930-ish. But in this little article right here that was in the New York Times, tells you about there is a Dr. Holmes who delivered an address on emergency on Wednesday evenings and a professor um, on Shakespeare and they gave lectures and they did all sorts of things that were given in the chapel. So it not necessarily meant that it was for prayer, but I'm guessing that it was um, for a multiple uses and prayer could have been one of them because why would they call it a chapel? They have a whole big hotel to do presentations. So, but this is a beautiful blow up of that 1904 picture. And I see a bell and a tower that looks like a little church to me. Our first actual house of worship would be St. Mary's of the Isle. Dating back to about 1910, Long Beach is still a summer community and they um, want to build a Catholic church here. And basically, this is from the book Brooklyn Eagle. They start raising money. This is around 1912. And this gentleman, who was a famous vaudevillian actor, Thomas Wise, helped raise money as part of the building fund to build St. Mary's. St. Mary's of the Isle, a church built upon the sand dunes of Long Beach. I like the top because the, the opener on this article says an aid to the growth of Long Beach. So it's telling you that people are still here only in the summertime, but they're saying that it's very important for them to have a place to go pray. And, and this is a Catholic church. So this establishment is not just for everyone to just to give lectures, but this is actually a Roman Catholic church. The photograph on the left uh, was a collection that was attributed um, this picture is from 1922. The church was actually built in 1915. This is a fabulous um, colorized postcard. Um, and it says Mary, St. Mary's was dedicated July 4th, 1915 by the Archbishop Bonzano. It was a summer church only basically. If you had to, if you had been able to stay here at that point in the winters, 
um, you went to St. Raymond's in East Rockaway because they did not have a permanent pastor or a priest at the church. It was not until about 1918 that they appointed their first full-time priest who was in charge and he was there, um, Reverend he uh, Edward Hoare, was here from 1918 to 1926, and then the church became a full-time establishment, summers and winters. Then we have, in 1922, we have the People's Church, which is on 111 Delaware Avenue. They are raising monies then to build this church, which is also upon the sands of Long Beach, a little bit later than St. Mary's, um, but I like it that when they named the church, it wasn't given a denomination, but it actually says that it's for all peoples. And I, I absolutely, I think this is a great thing. It's a non-domination, acceptance of all people to worship. And the beautiful stained glass that's um, in the windows portrays the Good Shepherd. They were actually donated by Senator Reynolds. And the dedication of this church was August 23rd, 1923. Um, this bottom photograph is um, a great shot of the West End looking west, and you could see the church and you could see the rising of the West End community. This is a present day photograph and in the Long Beach Herald back in 92 uh, for one of their anniversaries, they had this beautiful article, a two page article actually about the church, its beginnings and how the People's Church came to be in Long Beach. We have this article, which is um, from the Herald back in 201, and they're celebrating at that point a 75th anniversary. But we know St. Ignatius is the second Roman Catholic Church to be on the Barrier Island. Um, this was part of St. Mary's summer mission. And originally, here we go again with having other places, having multiple uses. There are masses back in 1918 before this church was built was at the West End Movie Theater. So um, it's like so incredible how we come full circle with our programs and how they interchange and inter or have everything depends one upon the other for our beginnings. So Long Beach is amazing in that sense. And this is a great photo of them building St. Ignatius. You could see um, this is a snowy picture uh, in the 20s. Um, they officially celebrated their first mass December 11th, 1926, and Bishop Malloy dedicated the church August 7th, 1927. They also, in 1954, um, they added the school, which is now St. Ignatius, it's a Catholic school. They also added um, a library, and also a convent, which is uh, run by the Dominican sisters. Our next place of worship is Temple Israel. And the building fund for this started, and it's our Long Beach's first shul, uh, June of 1920. And basically it's um, a Philip, they have Rabbi Goldberg, and, and I'm going to show you in our next slide, um, I found out an incredible story earlier today from Phyllis Wagner, who's a patron of the Long Beach Public Library, and in the Historical Society, that one of the people who was very instrumental in donating monies to build this temple is a very famous person, and they, you could still buy their shoes. I've seen them for sale. Um, Israel Miller of I. Miller Shoes. He was a great benefactor and supporting of the building of this temple back in 1920s. So if you know I. Miller Shoes, a lot of his, um, he donated a lot of his own money for building the temple. And I was told that there is a bust of him um, in the temple. And um, the, a lot of people don't know who that is, but I was told today by um, Mrs. Wagner that it's of uh, Israel Miller. Um, this is a great piece of uh, history. It tells you uh, the incorporation of the temple back in 1920, and it's telling you who was some of the um, president, the treasurers, the trustees, and honorary trustees. And when I look through the list, I know a lot of these people from history and from personal. I mean, Theodore Ornstein is a central federal bank. I think Louis Kahn worked at the bank as well. Um, you have um, Honorable Frank Frankel, he became mayor at some point. 
Um, these names are very, very, very um, part of the community's history. So you could see that they were part of Temple Israel and it's our first shul in Long Beach. Then as part of the expansion of Temple Israel, uh, the Talmud Torah building was dedicated in 1930, August 24th. So they build a school and this is from the Brooklyn Eagle dated back July 25th, 1929. And this is current picture of the Temple Israel. And basically then they added the Rose and Irving um, Center, which was dedicated. So this is a current photograph. Now we go back to St. James of Jerusalem Episcopal Church. When we opened the program, we talked about Grace Chapel. Now Grace Chapel, after the fire, um, a lot of those cottages burned down. So I don't know if that actually survived. It probably did not. The hotel definitely did not because that's the foundation block between Edwards Boulevard and Riverside on the boardwalk. So we know that I don't think many of those cottages survived. So Grace Chapel then has a name change and becomes St. James of Jerusalem Episcopal Church at 220 West Penn Street. And that is um, dedicated July 7, 1930. Um, they have also holding services at the Hotel Nassau in the interim. And I think also a lot of times services were held at people's homes. So I think it was not just the hotel, but a lot of congregants would lend out their personal homes and they were having services at their homes until this church was built. George Parsons from St. James um, was the clergy and basically he ministered the church and then you have them, what they sought in funds to build the actual church. And this is um, from May of 1930 they were seeking a $50,000 amount to build this church. So it's very interesting how um, it's reviewed in all the local and also the New York City newspapers. Um, back to January 5th, 1935, this is from the Freeport Review. And it's telling us that we should get back to basics. We should be back with everybody together, being the churches, the synagogues, we should be all working together. And I find that amazing for um, that time that everybody was trying to work together. This is a great shot and I didn't know, of course you see a, a funeral, but you don't know who it is. And then all of a sudden you find a, a clue. And I did find out who the person who passed away. It's Leonard Kip Rylander. It was his funeral, um, February 22nd, 1936. Um, his father, was a very, very, very well-known and very wealthy person in Long Beach at that time. And basically um, he passed away of pneumonia at the age of, I think, very young. He was a young person. And so basically um, this is from the New York Times. It's his obituary. And um, this is St. James Church back in 1936. Now we come upon a great, great story. And this can be um, going to come into a future program um, that I'll be doing that in May. Um, so let's talk about St. John's Lutheran Church by the Sea. This article is in the Brooklyn Eagle dated February 2nd, 1930. And it says on March 24th, 1927, they already acquired this property at 75 East Olive Street, but they never built the church yet. It was still vacant but the church owned the property. They actually were able to move into what they called back then the Idle Hour Mansion, located on Washington Boulevard and Beach Street. And that was their church for a small time, not very long, um, to about 1930, between 30 and 32. And basically then they vacated that and of course, they probably had service in other places until they actually built the church at 75 East Olive. But this old mansion has a great, great history that I read in this article. So in my May program, we're gonna be talking about the Idlauer Mansion in great detail. This is now the current uh, site of St. John Lutheran's Church by the Sea at 75 East Olive. 
And this is um, from the Brooklyn Times, 1930, um, where the Reverend um, is installed for the church and it's full-time community already by this time. And the dedication to the church, this is so amazing. The dedication for the church is aided by a plea. President Hoover sent out a personal greeting by telegram, and I say telegram, multiple telegrams, dropped by air, and it was Lutheran leaflets that fluttered in the sky as crowds of attend the Long Beach ceremony. So these life leaflets were thrown from a plane that were from President Hoover in celebration of this church opening. This is their dedication. Now we have another extraordinary building. This building was built in 1926. This is a photograph of the building in construction stages. This is from the Brooklyn Eagle, November 1st, 1925. The Long Beach Masons get temporary hall. Where are they going to have their temporary hall? It has to be one of two places. It could be at City Hall, it could be at the Hotel Nassau, but they are already starting this lodge and they're looking for temporary residents so that until this is finished being built. The Masonic Temple of Long Beach, this is the Masons begin a new temple. So here is the laying of the cornerstone of what they said is a $250,000 dollar building. This is from the New York Times and the inscription on the building says Long Beach Lodge number 1048 F and A and M 5926 to 1926 because that's when they built the building. As we know from prior programs that the Masonic Temple had many many faces. I didn't know there was a theater there. Now I come upon the Brooklyn Eagle, December 17th, 1942, that the USO was using and leasing the temple. Then I see in 1932 in the Brooklyn Eagle that Teddy Roosevelt's wife, Mrs. Roosevelt, was actually having a theater, a natal guild there. And she was doing this as part of the Guild of America. I mean, how more interesting of a building can you get? Now, when it was a theater at this time, I didn't know it was a theater. This is something I came upon in my research for my theater program. And as a young child, I actually used to go to bazaars there and I bought a piano, a roller piano, a Wurlitzer that was built in around 1911, between 1911 and 1920. And it just might just have been a leftover from their theaters at the Masonic Temple. And I bought this piano for $20 from the bazaar. The Masonic Temple chapter now is 839 Order of the Eastern Star. And this is now 1931. So they may have had a change in congregation. And this is dated from 31 to 1974. A very sad story, because Temple Beth Bell, which is at 570 West Walnut, um, is now basically you could see it if you go there it's very sad because it's boarded at the front because it's no longer a, a, a temple um, but this article is dated back to October 21st 1931 in which they're installing a rabbi um, and a cantor to open this temple um, it's very sad because you see that there was such a need for additional um, places of worship that all of these start to sprout up. And now this, of course, is closed. We have 1934, July 6th, um, the Our Lady of Miraculous Medal, which is in Point Lookout. Um, Father Michael Buckley was the pastor at St. Mary's. And basically, they had their services before the church was built at the Yield Firehouse in Point Lookout. And Dr. Hurley was a physician at the time. He was a temporary resident down there. He donated the property for them to build the church. And the dedication was done by Bishop Malloy, 1937. We have a Sephardic synagogue, it still stands. Um, Rabbi Asha Abitan guided the congregation from 1943 to 2006. The people who started this temple were Sephardic men from Castoria, Greece, 
from Izmir and Istanbul, Turkey. The congregants who originally came from the city, the Bronx, Washington Heights, were summer residents who then became year-round residents. What's very interesting about this temple is in original, um, they were not, it was not a religious institution. They came as a group of men who wanted to build a social club where they could come together and their families, they played cards. And then the group said they wanted to start a temple, a means of prayer. And um, this information, I reached out to the temple um, and I was able to contact Alyssa Farbiage, um, who's a wonderful English teacher, um, and Phyllis Wagner, who works and is part of the Historical Society, and they provided part of this oral history for this program today. So I thank Mrs. Farbiage and Mrs. Wagner. Temple Emmanuel, this is at 455 Neptune Boulevard. In May of 45, Tem Temple Emmanuel first held its services at the Hotel Isla on West Broadway. Their organization of the first and only reform synagogue in Long Beach. Um, Sylvia and Sam Schoenfeld services were held first also. Secondly, to the Masonic Temple on National Boulevard, um, Rabbi Shulman gave his um, time, he volunteered. And then of course, Rabbi Clickfield um, was the full-time rabbi, um, August of 1950. He stayed there for about 32 years. The groundbreaking for the hotel um, from the temple, excuse me, was September of 1951. Temple Zion, it's 62 Maryland Avenue in the West End. The people of the West End community in the 1940s, they thought that we should have our own temple closer to home and it would serve both the West End and Atlantic Beach. There was a building fund started and it was raised about $25,000. The dedication was attended uh, by Judge Saul Price, uh, J. Jar, Jar, Charles Zimmerman and County Supervisor, Joseph Carlino State Assembly, Theodore Ornstein, former mayor of Long Beach, and Joseph Kuhn of East Atlantic Beach. And I think Dr. Kuhn was superintendent of schools. Um, Rabbi Solomon Goldfarb at Temple Israel and Rabbi Kimmel of Temple Bethel, they all spoke at the ceremony and the laying of the cornerstone for this temple in the West End. This is the um, actual article from Long Beach Life, August 19, 1948, and the ad um, to welcome people to this dedication ceremony of their new building. Um, and the article basically is where the information is taken from of who was in attendance and um, who spoke that day and all the very intricate details of the dedication of the new temple in the West End. Um, right now, this is at 210 Edwards Boulevard, founded in 1946. Everybody calls it the Bach but it's the Bacharai Khamed Bach Jewish Center. Um, this uh, New York Times article says in a August 13, 1949, that the children will be the ones to open the temple. So I found that beautiful. Um, there were 36 boys and girls ages 11, eight, 11 to 19, and they were um, in a procession with their teachers came to open the temple that day. We did a whole program on the Christian Light Church. Um, of course, this is Reverend Evans, and this is the 1950 uh, Christian Light Missionary Baptist Church that was founded by him. Um, it tells you about where they started out in their garage at 710 Riverside. And basically, um, the church is still there, and this is you can check out our program. It's on our YouTube for um, in celebration of Black History Month. And um, this is a wonderful um, program that I'm referring to. So come down and take a look. And this is the Christian Light Missionary Baptist Church. Congregation Beth Shalom, which was at 315 Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, this was also in the beginnings in 1951, was called the East End Synagogue when it was incorporated. Um, the original building was um, not built yet. There was the old building, and they had services also in a tent and in the firehouse. Now, Rabbi Miller 
And Solomon Mendelssohn, who was the counter for the congregation, said there were about 650 families who practice conservative family values. Now, this was shared to me by um, Rabbi Miller's son, Frederick Miller. He's a gastroenterologist. And um, I was able to get contact with him by a very, very lovely, lovely woman. Her name is Mrs. Getzoff. And I spoke to her in depth about the temple. Now, when I first spoke to her and I asked her about it, she said, you know, I don't really remember too much. But then we just talked a little bit and then we hung up. And then I got a call back at the library saying, are you the lady looking for stuff on temple? Beth Shalom. And I said, yes, this is Eileen. And she goes, oh, you got to call the rabbi's son and you have to speak to this person and you got to speak to this person. And so from a person who said they didn't remember anything, she gave me an oral history that was so amazing that I had to incorporate all of that, what they said in this program. So it was also um, the beginnings of a Long Beach clergy council, which was an important part of Long Beach, where they brought the priests, the pastors and the rabbis to begin to come together and to talk about Long Beach and their community. The new temple, which is what's the picture of the shown picture was about 1967. And Rabbi Miller, of course, was here for 50 years. Um, Mrs. Getzoff also spoke about um, a social life for young couples and it was called the Young Married Set. So I thank Mrs. Getzoff for her, her contribution and to Rabbi Miller's son, Frederick Miller, for giving me information on a place that no longer exists since they tore it down. The New Life Church of Christ, um, which is actually around the corner from the library, it's about at 124 West Chester Street. The building was um, taken over. It was originally um, part of the veterans, um, the American Legion building, and they actually have now acquired it to be used as the church, and it's the New Life Church of Christ. Um, back then, Elders Jonas Jones was the congregation. It was at a storefront in the beginning, in the 70s, and then at when it, actually, I think it burnt, um, then the Marvin, Bishop Marvin Creech was elected pastor, and they incorporated the church in 72, and it moved to this building in 77. So Pastor Mark Moses shared the information with me, um, and basically he is the new pastor for the New Life Christ Church. The Lido Beach Synagogue at Fairway Road in Lido Beach. You walk every day to school, and you pass this house, but you don't know what it is. So Lido Beach Synagogue opened in 1966, where the service were given in this house that was on this house, on this site in one fairway road in Lido. When the beginning, the building was torn down to make way for the new temple, services were temporarily held at the firehouse. Um, so you see a picture of the house where they had held services there in, in the 60s. And then, of course, the new synagogue that's there today. The Evangel Revival Church at 569 National Boulevard. This is Pastor Dr. Dolores Miller. She spoke to me on the telephone and what a lovely, lovely woman. She said she started her church in 1975 in a garage on Hudson Street. It sounds so familiar. Pastor Miller said that her congregation was expanding rapidly and that around October of 1977, along with her husband, Levi Miller, they acquired the building at 569 National Boulevard, which at that time was a soda distribution warehouse, and it was purchased from Mrs. Yerman. This is the outside of the Evangel Revival Community Church, and one shot from inside was provided to me by her grandson. Young Israel, established in 1988. I had to take a quote from their website. Young Israel of the Long Beach is not just a shul, it's a warm and welcoming community. We encourage each other to grow spiritually, celebrate silkas together and support one another. So this is right from their, um, their website. And the Chabad of the Beaches, um, originally they had 60 West Beach Street, which is a home. And then they acquired um, part of the old temple that's down at 570 West Walnut, 
they only bought this section, which actually was part of JASA used to use this as a community center. Um, but now the Kabata of the Beaches owns that. And there on their website, it says the mission of the Kabata of the Beaches is to promote and strengthen Jewish awareness, pride, observance, and providing educational, cultural, and social activities to all Jewish families and individuals. And this comes right from their website. Center Point Church is a new church in Long Beach. It has a temporary um, established home at the Temple Emmanuel. It started on the Long Beach campus in 2016, where Pastor um, TK Kennedy also works with Children at Young Life, which is a great organization for young people to get together, um, to have camaraderie in the community. And I've taken this from their website, we exist to give everyone on Long Island multiple opportunities to hear and to respond to Jesus by being a missional and attractional church that leads people into deeper relationship with God. So this is not a promotion for God, but this is what they say their church is about. And it's a new establishment. Um, so I welcome them to the community. Um, since we've been here since uh, first established church back in 1880-ish, um, this is 2016. Then, interesting enough, going through the newspapers, I found other organizations or churches that were here, but I don't think they're here anymore. But I had to put them in, so I took a copy of the article, and it says, New Church Opens in Long Beach. And this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I had no idea. This dates back November 21st, 1996. They had a storefront at 66 West Park Avenue. Hindu temple founded in 1989 at 610 Laurelton Boulevard. This is right from the Long Beach Herald dated May 7th, 2009. It says congregants travel far and wide to pray at a rare Hindu temple in Long Beach. Wow, had not a clue. So reading the newspaper is a treasure of information and it supports that how many people are actually here. Now, I'm not saying this is an end all of how many places have been in Long Beach that are, are religious institutions or houses of worship, but I try to incorporate everybody in this presentation and forgive me if I have forgotten anyone. This is churches and synagogues um, through speaking to several people um, found out that the Long Beach Seventh-day Adventists they no longer have any place at 620 Park Place, which would be at the Christian Light Church. It seems they had uh, had, uh, had services there at some point. Um, the Kusada uh, Missionary Church, which is on Long Beach Boulevard, it looks like it's under construction. So I wasn't able to get anybody to contact them because the phone did not, it was not connected. And then in talking to Pastor Miller and her daughter, um, Mrs. Miles, they told me about three other churches back in the 60s and very interesting because church of god in christ number two west pine street um this is from her daughter she, uh, Ms. Star, uh pastor miller's daughter she said elder Roy goats had this church um and that was interesting and then she goes and you know on park street on east park street she says you know why j and l and i'm like j and l i says i was a little girl I remember JNL on East Park Street, which is now approximately where the bank is on the quarter of Park Place, uh, JJ Evans Boulevard and Park Avenue. Um, she said there was St. Stephen's and Pastor Stevens, who was the first woman pastor in Long Beach. I said, wow, that is so cool. Then Pastor Miller, also told me about the soul stirring church of God in Christ, which was on Park Place. It was a storefront. Pastor Alonzo Holly was the person who was in charge of that. And basically she had said to me, and this is from her telling me the story, that when I first came to Long Beach in the late 50s, I attended Christian Light Church. And then she said to me, and then I, I attended other churches such as, as the soul stirring church. And I started to learn to preach. And I was in multiple congregations and she said and then i made my way to become a pastor and open my own church 
She said, a lot of young people followed me and I felt the need to be able to be a pastor. And she went and got her doctorate and she is the pastor of the church that is down on National Boulevard. So in closing of my program, oral history is just as important as the um, history that you can get from a newspaper article or from documentation or from leaflets that are left behind. But some of these memories are just as important because there are three other places that I had not been aware of that existed back in the 60s that were functional churches, be it in someone's house or in a, a storefront. And they served our people.